it's honestly cool that that happened because before you speak, you have like all these butterflies and you're super nervous no matter how many times you do it. So I got all that out of the way. And now I'm going to be super fun and engaging. <laughs> so um, they gave a really good intro about who I am, but my name is Isha. I'm a senior UI UX designer developer at Twitch, and I focus on the design system. Um, previously, I was a senior UX engineer on the Lightning Design System team at Salesforce. And today, I want to talk to you all about maturing design systems. Um, if most of this group is designers, ideally, you've at least heard of the term design system before. Um, can you actually raise your hand if you know what a design system is? So I know. OK, cool. Most of the room has at least heard of it. Um, for those of you who don't, or in case you want a refresher, a design system is the single source of truth which groups all the elements that allow teams to design, realize, and develop a product. My old teammate and friend Gina Ann of Design Systems fame has very eloquently described design systems to be composed of tangible and non-tangible elements. A design system offers a consistent and well-designed pattern library, tools for designers and developers, code-ready components, guidelines, and plenty of usable resources. At the same time, a design system also offers some abstract elements like brand values, shared ways of working, shared beliefs about the product, UI UX best practices, and more. Design systems have been very happening in the design, for the past, design world for the past few years. There's a ton of talks, blog posts, resources, that cover what a design system is and how to get one started to introduce efficiency, code sharing, and design consistency within design and development orgs. I've learned that a great portion of tech companies that exist today, whether they're big or small, are all adopting the ways of design systems. And so this talk is for those of you who have set up a design system and want to know what to do next, or just general information about you know, if you plan to start one, what are all the things that you can expect down the road beyond just you know, what you'll have to do initially. So if you've set up a design system at your company, you've most likely made an inventory of designs and patterns across your app. This inventory could include user interface patterns, interaction design patterns, branding patterns like color palettes and type styles, and so on. You must have also gotten buy-in from at least some stakeholders, the stakeholders who saw your inventory and realized that the number of inconsistencies across your app was costly and that the product value would increase with an organized system focused on design. Then you might have created a repository for people to access your components and guidelines. For many teams, this is a website that contains a component library and usage documentation, but it can also be something like a sketch file or a Figma file that holds all your team's unified patterns or a GitHub repo with grab and go code. So what happens next? What happens after you have your first design system framework set up? As a design system matures, it needs a lot of love, and it needs that love in a lot more ways than you might anticipate. How many of you have played with Tamagotchis in the 90s? Oh, sweet, okay, a lot of people, cool. So if any of you aren't familiar, the Tamagotchi was a handheld digital pet that you had to take care of in order to keep it alive. So consider the Tamagotchi. You have to feed it, you have to give it training, you have to keep its stress levels low, you have to nurture it, and this is like a tiny egg computer thing that you have to do all that for. So believe it or not, that's kind of what you have to do with your design system once you get it off the ground. You have to treat it like any other product, and you have to make sure you give it the attention it needs in all areas to make sure it succeeds, because at the end of the day, even though you might work in a company that's its own product, your design system is its own product within that company. A design system can be ready to mature whether it's been a year since its inception or more. The Lightning design system is one of the few design systems out there that's truly mature in nature at this point since it was launched in early 2015. 
Twitch's core UI design system launched in early 2017 and has since gained a ton of momentum and is used across the Twitch ecosystem today. I'm going to share some case studies about how we scaled core UI and lightning design system during my time on both teams. Just a disclaimer, the paths we chose to follow might not necessarily work for your system, and the stuff you might have to do would be different, as it should be, because every system should be unique. But I do hope that these case studies serve as a point of inspiration and are a little more tangible things that you can walk away with. So over the past couple of years of building, launching, and keeping up with systems, both teams learned to focus on certain key areas in order to sustain their design system as it matured. This isn't a definitive order in which you should focus on these areas, it's just basically how it came to my head. But the different areas are maintaining components, adoption and implementation, support, documentation, tooling, and strategy and architecture. When you first launch your design system, you're definitely going to find yourself building a lot of new components or UI patterns from scratch. This could range from something as simple as a button or something as complicated as a walkthrough modal. You may, also, you may mostly be adding things to your system that are being implemented in your app for the first time. So first time use cases for even components like accordions. As your design system matures, however, a lot of your focus could end up shifting to maintaining those components that already exist and not building any new ones ever again, potentially. Of course, you're, you could always be building, and there's an infinite number of things that you could really do um, with web design, but the amount of building you do will most likely decrease, and instead you're going to be finding yourself adding variations or modifications to a lot of components that you already have to make them more flexible. Building new one-off components is something that would not work for our design system, and I believe it's not what a design system should be about. Adding flexibility to your components ensures that your component library will scale and will be used by a larger number of people. For the Lightning design system, we focused on making sure our components were flexible by adding variants, states, modifiers, and examples to our base components. So this is an example of a progress indicator that was you know, just a simple progress indicator, but we added a bunch of different things, like an example of when it's in a modal, an example of when it's using a different background, um, if there's an error for it, what all the different states look like. Variants are different versions of the component. States show what happened when you interact with the component. Modifiers are different style changes you can apply to the component by class name. And examples show how that component could be used out in the wild. These are all ways that we can update and maintain our components instead of having to create new ones for every little design or usage change. And so next up, adoption. As your design system matures, you'll both want more and more people to start using it, while at the same time more and more people will start using it on their own anyway. How do you make sure that you're able to spread the word about the benefits of using your system while also focusing on helping people learn how to use your system properly? You have to socialize the system to the people that you want consuming it. Teach them, help them, and most importantly, have empathy and work with them in adopting and implementing the system. You can't just expect people to use something that you put out exactly as you intended, you have to kind of help them grow into the framework that you've created. And maybe modify the framework that you've created if you get feedback that it doesn't work for them. At Twitch, we focus heavily on adoption and implementation across the entire organization. Some ways in which we reach out to people are through office hours, once a week, where anyone can come and ask us questions about the design system or design reviews, or just front-end related questions in general. We send out monthly newsletters to our whole tech and design teams that summarize all the updates that we've made from the design system side of things. And we've also been added to the technical new hire onboarding, so we can make sure that all the new engineers are aware that the design system exists and how to actually use it. It stinks when new, design, new engineers or designers join, and you're on a core, you know, core UI or a design system team, and they're just kind of like, oh, we didn't even know that that was a thing that we could leverage and use. So you need to make sure that 
you know, your team is pretty well spread out and everyone knows about it from the get-go so that they can know that they can start using it. At Salesforce, we had a regular design review session called Standards Reviews. Because we only had three major releases a year, which means that we only pushed code public three times a year, we had two week-long standard reviews where we watched for patterns that deviated from what had been established. We also watched for new patterns. In the last standards reviews that I participated in, we saw an accordion component from four different design teams that we were able to standardize for our system simply by having the platform and the conversation. Also, many times, dev teams would believe that they needed a brand new component for a design that they were given. But in reviews, we found that their component could actually be constructed from smaller patterns that already existed, which the designer put in their designs for that reason, but they weren't able to communicate to the developer. We gave them guidance on pulling those patterns together, and sometimes we decided to create an example in the system to help out other people who might have the same use case. All in all, in design systems work, it's necessary to consistently work with the people who are going to be consuming your product. And I found that the more our design system matures, the more we all need to help the people that are actually using it, use it properly and effectively. And in the spirit of helping people, that brings me to the next area, support. For all those people who are adopting your design system. When it comes to support, I've noticed similar patterns and issues during my time on both the Lightning team and the Core UI team. As a design systems team, you're serving very low-level APIs to consumers with your components, but they're so low-level that changes in even the DOM structure can break your consumer's feature. As your design system matures and is adopted across your entire organization, it'll mean that your internal devs will start to be encouraged to change their components that already existed and adopt the design system. You're going to, at some point, encounter teams that are resistant to giving up UI control. They want the designers and the developers want to be in charge of what their UI looks like. But the conversation is going to go fairly smoothly when you start doing this stuff, because most developers, for some reason, are not super savvy with front-end code. I'd even go so far to say that a lot of engineers are UI-phobic. Um, and in fact, during my time on both Lightning and on the core UI team, a lot of devs would be happy if our teams would just do their jobs for them in adopting the design system, and they didn't really want to have to meddle with the HTML, CSS, and low-level JavaScript that it would take to implement you know, the design system components. So while office hours and standard reviews are great points of support contact, they are areas that are entirely under our control. But being a team that works on the internet means that people will use any and every avenue of the internet that they know to contact you the second something goes wrong with your product. And so, it's important to plan your support strategy before you actually need it, or have some semblance of an idea of what all the avenues are that you want to plan to offer support. It might start off small, it might be manageable, it might only be you know, a, a very small number of avenues to begin with, but what I've experienced while working on two maturing design systems is there will eventually be an endless amount of support channels that you have to pay attention to. Twitch is still on the younger end, so our support avenues include a designated Slack channel for design system-specific help and the usual GitHub and Jira issues. We participate in design reviews and have office hours as well. And one I actually didn't add, but I thought of earlier today, was the fact that we get a lot of feedback on Reddit. A lot of our users give us tons and tons of feedback on Reddit. And if you've been on Reddit before, you know what kind of feedback it is. So not the most professional. <laughs> so we have to deal with a wide range of different feedback types. On the Lightning team, on the other hand, we were inundated. While I was on the team, we had internal and external support chan channels to monitor, which included everything from Slack, Hangouts, HipChat, Twitter, two internal Salesforce social services called Chatter and Gus, because we all need more social media. We had added support activities like standard reviews, accessibility reviews, and office hours. We had external open source GitHub repos, internal GitHub repos. We had a Salesforce-specific gamified learning system called Trailhead to get started with the framework. 
So the list just kind of went on forever. And I'm forgetting email. There's obviously endless amounts of emails on top of that as well, which no matter what design system you work on or where you work really, that's something that you always have to monitor and track as well. So make sure you establish a system that makes handling your support easy. And that kind of means that you can be choosy about what you choose to offer support on. If your team has a hard stance and they don't want to offer support on, I don't know, hip chat, or they don't want to offer support on Twitter or something, then just communicate that and make it known from the beginning so you can pave the way for what support channels you actually want to be responsible for. I personally had previously grappled with a support ticketing service, similar to kind of like customer support, and adding Slack bots to our Slack groups that could pull answers to questions from a database. Um, but there's no one answer solution to support, and you just, again, have to plan for it. So moving on to the next thing, Documenta documentation is extremely important as your design system matures. On core UI, Documentation is an area where we're lacking and putting a lot of time and resourcing to improve. And one of the biggest reasons why is because the team was going so fast in the beginning and zipping through the building phase that docs got left for later. Guess what? When it comes to documentation, there is no later. Also, a hole I've learned that a ton of people fall in is assuming that people will know how to use the thing that they built right off the bat. For example, a component as simple as a button seems like a no-brainer. You shouldn't have to teach someone how to use a button and when. But, of course, there's two different ways to implement a button, and the difference between those implementations means a lot, especially for accessibility. So our team has been doing a ton of research and experimentation around how to make documentation contribution easier and more accessible for people outside of our immediate team. That means people on our team who are familiar with being able to design and code at the same time, wanting to make contribution easier from people who might not be into coding or might not be familiar with you know, GitHub or anything like that. So one way we've made strides in making documentation easier to contribute to is by making a separate repo in GitHub that's solely for documentation. The doc structure is super easy to understand, and all the docs can be written in Markdown. We've even built some doc-specific components that you can reference in Markdown that will always behave exactly the same way, so designers who are unfamiliar with the code can still expect their doc pages to look as they intended. Being able to contribute to docs in Markdown might seem like it's a no-brainer for some people who are familiar with code, but it's made it super easy for us to get contributions from designers because all it really is is essentially writing text with a couple things that you need to put in before your text just to control formatting. And that's awesome. Even though we're using GitHub, our designers feel less intimidated to dive in and contribute since we've set up the repo to be as human-friendly as possible. So here's an example of how our team at Twitch built doc-specific components to help make contribution easier. One of the components we've made to help our designers effectively explain do's and don'ts in certain guidelines is what you see here. On the presentation level, it's a pretty straightforward do's and don'ts UI pattern that you might have also seen in like Google material design or something like that. Under the hood, it's actually really simple too. When the designer's writing Markdown for her docs, she can just use these pre-formatted Markdown blocks that only need a type definition, which means you either tell it the type do or the type don't, and an image URL to go along with them. So after they're able to do this, it ends up looking exactly like this. So contributing to documentation, even though it lives in GitHub, is now much easier for non-technical people with pre-styled markdown blocks like these and being able to use markdown at all. Making contribution to, to documentation easy is super important to take the pressure off the design system team to write all of the usage guidelines and important information about the patterns, especially if you're going to eventually be getting pattern contributions from people who are outside of your core design systems team. Everyone who's involved in the design and the construction can give back to the system as well. 
And so in the same vein, focusing on tooling after your design system has taken off is a good step to ensure you're adding efficiency to your workflow. At first launch, it's common to just kind of throw things together and put something out there. But after you spend more and more time on it, you might want to start building or implementing some tooling to make sure you're not throwing resources towards tasks that could be completely automated. This is a tool that our team built called the Core UI Prototyping Tool. It's an interactive tool for creating, modifying, or prototyping with Core UI. The main reason this tool was built was in order to give designers and engineers a way to play around with Core UI code to see what's possible before constructing an entire feature. It, gave, or it gives designers a chance to take their designs the extra mile, and it gives developers a chance to make sure they're able to use Core UI effectively. And what it basically is, is all of our CSS, all of our JavaScript bundled together in this one isolated instance where you can just kind of imagine it like a playground. You can just kind of play around with the code however you want to. We've also been able to leverage this tool. It's built off using React, so you can write JavaScript in it as well. So we've also been able to leverage the tool to test and illustrate scenarios within our app. The tool you see as it is in this image has been used to create a latency simulation to help explain how placeholders for specific components would look like with a range of added latency. So this is actually a drop down where you can choose from two seconds to up to like 15 seconds or something. And it kind of shows all the different placeholders taking their time to trickle into actual content. It shows how much performance actually matters when it comes to scaling an app. So an important thing to mention is that building your tool, your own tools isn't necessary. This is something that we built in-house on our own because it was pretty easy to spin up. Um, but you should try to leverage open source tools or things that already exist to kind of just see how people can you know, react to the tools that you make that are specific to your design system. Um, and also just focus on solving the problems that are specific to your design system and the people who are consuming it. So if this was something that our designers didn't actually need, but we had, you know, a developer on our team was like, I really want to, I'm really good at this thing, so I'm just going to make this tool and hopefully people use it or I get some recognition for it. That, you know, doesn't make sense and that's not fun. So try to build tooling around the things that your consumers actually need. So I wasn't exactly sure what to call this section, so I bucketed my thoughts into strategy and architecture. But what I mean to say is that when you first start building your design system and you anticipate growth, have a plan and strategy for how you're going to scale your architecture. Of course, when you first release a system, it will most likely be small and will not consider all the potential use cases for all the users. However, it really pays off to do a deep dive into your intended audience and consumers and make a plan for how to scale the architecture of your system to fit your users' needs. So at Twitch, we use React. I'm sure even though this is a group of designers, you're all somewhat familiar with what React is. It's a JavaScript library and framework. Um, but J React uses the word component to describe basically everything. And the word component has become so convoluted that a component, no matter the size, no matter whether it's presentational or functional or both, no matter the use case, it's still called a component. So when your design system is small and just starting out, calling everything that exists within your design system in, bleh, within your design system, a component is still super passable. However, after the system gets a good amount of adoption, like it did with Core UI, it was time to work on some way to recreate a scalable hierarchy of information and separate atomic versus composite components. We brainstormed a new taxonomy to classify the different parts of our system and how we wanted to convey their use case to our users. So we've come up with three main definitions as the definitions of the parts of our design system. So we have primitives, which are the building blocks of the design system. They're small, single-purpose components that can be used to build bigger components. So think of like a button or an input. Then we have patterns, which are composed of two or more primitives. 
And then we have principles, which are higher level concepts and guidelines around how to use our primitives and patterns in common user flows. On our design system website, which you're getting a little sliver of a glimpse of, um, we've separated out the primitives, patterns, and principles into their own sections to start normalizing the names and their meanings. As a team, we've also made it a rule to never refer to any parts of our system as components anymore, just to make sure that we're maintaining and socializing the new taxonomy and moving away from keeping things as confusing as it is when you just call everything under the sun a component. So we did this so we could establish a consistent nomenclature around all the different parts of our system. Not everything can be a component, and in communicating with both designers and developers, it's important to distinguish the specifics of what you're referring to to encourage proper usage of patterns and reusability. Had we done it from the beginning, we could have had improved communication between our designers and developers by having a controlled vocabulary, and we could have had a sound classification of need-based patterns provided by the design system. But as our design system matured, it's something we learned we desperately needed. So it's important that you have at least somewhat of a roadmap beyond just building designs and components and making sketch files and UI libraries so that you can maintain a solid framework and consider future use cases and ideas as well. And so moving on to my last point, shared governance. In the beginning, it's usually not hard for small design systems teams to keep track of and maintain governance over patterns. That means that your design systems team is the team that is controlling everything from the code to the design to how it's um, socialized, how it's documented, all of that. But as the system matures, more people join across the org and research demands change, it becomes a lot to handle for a really small number of people. So as your design system matures, it's important to expand beyond just your core team so that everyone has buy-in. And so everyone feels like they're contributing to the design system that the whole company is moving towards using. It's not just a really small group of people who are kind of like dictating the way the entire company has to work and function. So while I was at Salesforce, we had been experimenting with how to share that governance across the company. At the time, we had expanded beyond just the initial core Lightning Design System team, which was just five of us, into three different teams that split responsibility and stayed in close contact via standards reviews and office hours, where there were representatives from all three teams. We had a Platform Foundation UX team that was responsible for design patterns and guidelines. We had UX Creative, which focused on visual design only. And then we had UX Engineering, which was the team that I was on, um, which focused on component patterns and accessibility. By divvying up the work between more people, each person had more time to focus on what they were best at. And also, it gave us a path to scale. So I've told you a lot about what my teams have done and what has worked well for us. An area where we're still really trying to figure it out is communication. What's a good way to communicate changes that happen to your design system to all of your users? These changes can range from component additions to component updates to just general design modifications. We're still unsure of the best way to report those changes out to everyone who consumes our product. So at Salesforce, one thing we tried was automating release notes, where based on every single commit message we made, it compiled this long list of every single change that the user could expect. Um, but it didn't work out in all the ways that we would have liked to because it wasn't human friendly, not super legible, lots of scrolling, people didn't want to read it. And so at Twitch, we rely on our monthly newsletters and Slack updates to get the word out about changes. So I have an open question for all of you. How does your team tackle communication for your design system? Or if you don't work on a design system and you just work on designs in general, how does your team communicate talking about what those design changes are to the larger organization? Um, if you feel like your team does something that you think could work for us or for others, please let us all know. Or just at me on Twitter and I can compile feedback and post it somewhere. 
So just to recap, a couple good areas to focus on as your design system matures range from maintaining your components to setting up good documentation to building tools for efficiency. Because a design system should be a living product, taking care of it will never end. You can buy a new Tamagotchi, but it would be a huge pain to start a new design system. It's good to make sure that once you get your design system off the ground, you're considering key areas to make sure it scales and succeeds. So I want to talk, close this talk out by saying that as a design system community or just a design community in general, one of the main reasons why I chose to talk about how you need to nurture a design system is by giving it love is because empathy is going to help what, be what helps any design product of your skill and especially your design system. Not everything has to be super technical. Not everything has to be super robotic. You have to remember that your consumers are actually people at the end of the day. And if you do everything right technically, you have all the right designs, it'll be fine. But empathy is actually going to be what helps you scale the most and helps you, you know, get your maturing design system to the place that it needs to go. We don't all need to take our day job super seriously, and we need to make sure that we're having fun because it's just the internet at the end of the day. Thank you. Talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.